everyone. I'm Sabrina Hong. I'm a hardware engineer on the Qubit Calibration and Testing team, also known as the QCATS team. And I'll be going over some of our ongoing work towards improving calibration of large quantum processors. So I'll start by going over some basics of calibration before diving into some of the challenges that we face when it comes to calibration at scale, uh, namely robust and rapid automation, obtaining uniformly high performance, and maintaining stable performance over time. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with some fundamentals. Uh, what is calibration and, and why do we have an entire talk about it? Well, if our goal is to run algorithms on a quantum computer, we need some way to translate a quantum circuit into analog outputs that execute the operations that we've asked for. So this here is a really simple block diagram of what this might look like. You might define some circuit, uh, that circuit gets compiled down into waveforms. Those waveforms then become low level instructions that go to the electronics, uh, which will then output said waveforms. So calibration really takes care of this first part. Uh, we use several different calibrations to figure out how to take our quantum circuit and compile it down into waveforms. So what does a calibration actually look like? Uh, I'm gonna give a very simple example of how one might calibrate the readout resonator drive frequency. So here um, we're sweeping the frequency of the readout tone on the left while varying the qubit state. What we actually get back is this single shot data, meaning each point in the cloud is a single measurement uh, for when we prepare the qubit in the ground state, which is in blue versus the first excited state in red. We can then further process this data to look at what the cloud separation looks like as a function of the readout drive frequency that we've swept and select the frequency that really maximizes the distance between the two clouds. Uh, we can call this readout drive frequency calibrated now um, and use it for future experiments. So calibrating specific parameters really allows us to learn about the device as we go. So in our readout frequency example, we assumed that we already knew how to prepare our qubit in the ground in an excited state, probably from an earlier calibration. In this way, calibration is really a bootstrapping problem where individual parameters are calibrated by the sequence of in situ experiments, uh, and they can provide information and context directly for the next set of experiments. And really, calibration can mean a lot of things. Uh, in our case, uh, we can sweep a parameter to directly calibrate that control, like the readout frequency example, or here we have two other examples of spectroscopy where we might sweep the bias, or Robby where we might sweep the amplitude of a microwave pulse. In these types of calibrations, we're directly measuring and updating a parameter that we wish to calibrate. Other calibrations um, can take data that informs us about inherent properties of the system, uh, which allow us to build a model for future calibrations while not necessarily calibrating a specific parameter. Um, for example, in this bottom right here, um, this calibration where we measure the qubit frequency as a function of DC bias builds a frequency model for that qubit, uh, which we can then use later down the line when we need to pulse our qubits, say, to an entangling interaction frequency. This sort of bootstrapping way of thinking about system calibration can really be reduced to a graph traversal problem um, on this DAG or directed acyclic graph, uh, which is automatable, flexible, and extensible. Um, a framework like this can really help us ensure that devices are calibrated in a standardized way. So for example, if I calibrate one device and I wanna compare it to the performance of another, I have some kind of, uh, I have some kind of idea that they were calibrated in the same way. Um, and as we develop more advanced calibration techniques to fine tune performance, this graph structure makes it really easy for us to continuously develop and refine our calibration procedures without changing any underlying infrastructure. So if we look at this calibration graph here, um, this is an example calibration graph for just two qubits where each of the circles is a calibration or a node. Um, and you can imagine inserting one of these nodes, a new calibration type into this graph pretty easily. So in addition to bootstrapping individual calibrations, we rely on different device configurations um, to calibrate different parameters of the device. Uh, each configuration kind of contains its own calibrations that then get mapped onto this calibration graph. So to start, uh, we have this, what's called the root configuration, where all we know about the device are the design specifications. Um, in this configuration, qubits aren't placed at any specific operating frequency. But rather what we do is we learn really fundamental parameters about the device at this stage, like qubit and coupler yield, say flux offsets, mutual inductances or couplings that we can really get through these spectroscopy type experiments. These fundamental parameters then become the basis for models which allow us to build our next set of configurations, which we call the single qubit configurations. And here we can really isolate single qubits by biasing away all other neighboring qubits and couplers from information that we learned in the root configuration. 
And this allows us to learn detailed information about each qubit in isolation, like its bias and frequency dependence, coherence times as a function of frequency, say coupling to neighboring qubits and couplers. And oftentimes, um, this stage of calibration gives us all the information we need to feed back to device design or fabrication if what we're trying to do is go through rapid cycles of learning. However, if what we want to do is study entangling gates or run multi-qubit algorithms, uh, we can use the information that we get from the single qubit configurations to build what's called a grid configuration. Uh, this is where we can really start to do sort of larger device level optimizations, uh, where we can start to achieve high fidelity single and two qubit gates. Later in this talk, I'll be going more into detail about the system level optimizations we do to inform these grid configurations. So now that we've established these fundamentals, uh, I'll be diving into some of the challenges we face at scale. Um, and I'm going to frame this in the context of our Sycamore 2 processor. Our second generation Sycamore um, has a total of 72 flux tunable qubits, 72 readout resonators, and 121 tunable couplers. For qubit control, we rely on microwave pulses and uh, static and dynamic DC biases to change the frequency of our tunable qubits. For readout, we multiplex six resonators per readout line and perform measurement by kind of sending microwave pulses in and demodulating the return signal at room temperature. Finally, our tunable couplers also require both static and dynamic DC biases, and that allows us to control the coupling between qubits uh, when we want them to be isolated versus when we want them to interact, say, in an entangling interaction. So one key challenge with these processors um, is that with variations in both fabrication and design, each qubit, resonator, coupler, they're unique, uh, which means they need their own independent set of experiments to calibrate control parameters. So as an example, these are some parameters from the Sycamore device where we ran our surface code experiments. Um, you can see that we have variations in the qubit maximum frequency, the anharmonicity, and differences in, say, the coupler bias offsets. With this many components, uh, we end up with approximately 8,000 individual parameters that need to be calibrated per Sycamore 2 device. Uh, that number is only going to grow as we continue to scale the devices up. Uh, this level of calibration can be a pretty daunting task and can take weeks to even, or even months to complete. And if we just had to only ever calibrate one device, uh, maybe we wouldn't care so much if it actually took a whole month to calibrate all the control parameters. But the reality is that we often have to iterate on different devices to improve performance, either through changes in device design or changes through the fabrication process. Uh, this requires not only robust automation that can reliably handle, say, corner cases, uh, be able to recover itself from failures, but also speed um, to enable more cycles of learning, say, in a fixed amount of time. Later this afternoon, uh, my colleague Ofer will be giving a talk about some of these cycles of learning, namely around our investigations into component yield. One of the essential developments in our calibration infrastructure that enables these rapid cycles of learning was the parallelization of our calibration procedures. We employ strategies to kind of avoid adverse effects from crosstalk and nearby couplings when taking into account what calibrations can and can't be done in parallel. This really allows us to reduce the total number of calibration experiments on the processor down from over 6,000 to less than 1,000. And that actually enables us to do a full device bring up of Sycamore 2 devices in approximately a week, where Sycamore 1 devices, which have 54 qubits, in serial could take multiple weeks. Because of parallelization, the total number of experiments that need to get run will be fixed even as we scale up, uh, which is going to give us a greater advantage, actually, as devices get larger. So in addition to being able to calibrate quickly, uh, we want to be able to achieve uniform performance across the processor when executing algorithms. We navigate this task by trying to place qubit idle and pair interaction frequencies uh, in a way that optimizes for high performance across the entire system. This is a pretty intense task when you consider the 72 idle frequencies and 121 interaction frequencies we need to set, which all have their own sets of constraints. Um, traditional global optimizers are really inefficient here, even for much smaller scale processors, say tens of qubits. So we rely on our in-house snake optimizer originally developed by our colleague Paul Klimov, which leverages graph traversal and does a step-by-step -step incremental optimization across the processor. Uh, these incremental optimizations uh, actually are visually similar to the arcade game snake, uh, hence the name. Now, we rely on the single qubit calibrations that we did in those single qubit configurations 
to inform an error model that we feed into the snake frequency optimizer. Now, plotted here on the right is the qubit T1 spectrum as a function of qubit frequency. And this is just an example of some of the data that's used to inform the cost functions that the snake optimizer employs. To give you a little bit of an example, the snake cost function will penalize regions that have low T1, or say with coherent two-level systems that the qubit is interacting with, and will likely not try to place an idle or interaction frequency in those regions. Once the snake optimizer determines a viable solution for the grid, uh, we now have a starting landscape where we can start to begin our grid configuration calibrations. So to visualize this concept, we can look at what the grid of idle and interaction frequencies looks like as we add more components to the cost function that the snake optimizes over. So starting here at the left, we have an unconstrained processor. And first what we'll do is we'll add in a constraint that minimizes the qubit frequency trajectory when going between idle to interaction frequencies and back. Uh, we know that this avoids errors that can be incurred from pulse distortions uh, that can occur when you try to pulse very large Z amplitudes. What this results in is interaction frequencies that look nearly degenerate, as shown on the bottom, uh, and a checkerboard pattern for the idols in, uh, in the plot above, where the frequencies are above and below the interaction frequency. Next, we can penalize frequency degeneracies uh, to avoid errors incurred from crosstalk when gates are running simultaneously. Um, this particular configuration minimizes frequency collisions over layers of simultaneous gates in the surface code and resembles a multi-layer checkerboard pattern. Uh, the snake optimizer is really powerful in that we can actually embed algorithm-specific information to get better performance. Finally, we can include errors from dephasing, relaxation, and other error, error mechanisms that we might have identified in our single qubit calibrations. Uh, this often leads to a frequency configuration with, with no discernible pattern. And really, this sort of full system-level optimization is necessary to achieve uniformly high performance across the processor. And similar to gate optimization, we can actually optimize our readout parameters independently from our gate frequencies by calibrating various readout-related parameters uh, similar in spirit to my readout frequency example at the beginning of this talk. Um, shown here are some of these parameters, like the resonator ring downtime, qubit resonator couplings, measurement efficiency, et cetera, feeding these parameters into models uh, for different readout error mechanisms. We optimize the qubit frequency during readout, the readout pulse length, and power individually for each qubit using the snake optimizer. And we model errors uh, from finite SNR, say qubit, qubit relaxation during readout, uh, any potential swapping with neighboring qubits, as well as qubit state transitions that can be induced by the resonator drive. This optimization was really essential to our surface code work where we required fast mid-circuit measurement. Okay, so now we've calibrated the gates on the processor and we're ready to start the surface code experiment. I wish I could say we were done at this point, but this unfortunately isn't the end of the line for device calibration. Calibrated parameters can drift as a function of time, whether that be drifts in temperature that causes changes in room temperature wiring and electronics, or actual fluctuations in performance of the device itself, say from changing coherence times or fluctuating two-level systems that interact with the qubits. Because the timescales of these drifts can vary, um, regular monitoring and maintenance is required to upkeep the performance of the device. Even with regular upkeep, uh, if you were just kind of maintaining the exact grid that you had calibrated at the beginning, if a two-level system or TLS that wasn't interacting with the qubit when it was initially calibrated comes to town, it can render the original cost functions and error models that we use for the system optimization step to be obsolete and that will require a recalibration of any affected gates from this TLS. So one of the things we can do is include historical TLS information in our cost functions, and that can help us capture this drift and build more, error, more robust error models over time. When monitoring performance um, metrics of the device, we can identify when system performance has degraded and trigger a recalibration based on those metrics. This is something that we call metric-based recalibration. Uh, we identify outliers um, in metrics that could include things like randomized benchmarking or cross-entropy benchmarking. And then we'll use the snake optimizer to just locally re-optimize the outlier specifically rather than fully re-optimizing the entire system. Uh, from there, we're able to recalibrate any qubits and pairs whose idle and interaction frequencies have changed. And as much as speed was important in our initial processor calibration, 
Speed plays an even more important role here, where we need recalibration solutions to be faster than our nominal timescales of drift, which makes re-optimizing the entire processor kind of not possible. And with that, I'd just like to summarize, um, scaling up processors poses several challenges in the world of device calibration, and we're continuing research and efforts into creating faster, more robust, fully automated systems to calibrate our processors of today and beyond. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Mm -hmm.